Uh, so I want to welcome Dr. Erin Ramos. Uh, again, she's with the Office of Population Genomics. Erin uh, manages a portfolio of research um, it, that includes a collaborative project that, that develops a set of standardized phenotypic and exposure measures for use in genome-wide association studies and related research. Uh, she'll be able to explain a lot better than I can what exactly that looks like. Uh, her research in interests include uh, genetic ep epidemiology of dementia, genome-wide association studies, and gene environment interactions in complex disease, and ELSI research, including informed consent for large-scale genomic studies. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Dr. Ramos, for joining us today, and I will turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Sarah, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to first thank Sarah and the Education and Community Involvement Branch for inviting me to speak with you this afternoon. I learned from Sarah, I do have a few custom animations um, throughout the presentation, and some of you that dialed in through web access might not be able to see those, but I don't think it'll um, take away from the presentation. Okay, so let's see. Let's move to the next slide. So in the next 20 minutes or so, I plan to first provide you with some, some general background on genome-wide association studies and why it's so important to use standard methods for assessing the phenotypes and exposures of interest from your study participants. This will lead into an introduction to the Phoenix Project. And um, just quickly, Phoenix stands for Consensus Measures for Phenotypes and Exposures. And the Phoenix Toolkit then provides a resource of standard phenotypic and exposure measures for incorporation into genomics research studies. And then finally, we'll just play around with the Phoenix Toolkit and we'll explore some of the measures that are currently available. So as you know, genome-wide association studies, or, or GWAS as we call them, have become a really common tool for dissecting the genetics of complex diseases. And a GWAS is typically defined as any study of genetic variation across the entire human genome that is designed to identify genetic associations with observable traits, such as blood pressure or weight, or the presence or absence of a disease or condition, such as diabetes. So I thought we could quickly walk through the results of a typical GWAS, just so we're on the same page. Um, in 2009, Chris Amos reported results from a GWAS of lung cancer, and this was in Nature Genetics. I've got the reference here. This was a multi-stage study design, which is typical of our genome-wide association studies. So in the first stage, which is often called the discovery stage, they genotyped roughly 1,100 cases with uh, histologically confirmed non-squamous cell lung cancer and the equivalent amount of controls. And they use the Illumina human HapMap bead chip, which interrogates roughly 317,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms, or SNPs, across the entire human genome. They then basically compared the genotypes at these 317,000 markers and cases and controls to detect any statistically significant associations. And then in stage two, which we usually call the replication phase, they picked their top statistical hits from the discovery GWAS and genotyped these SNPs in two additional study populations. So here are the results from the initial scan. Um, what you're seeing in front of you is what we call a Manhattan plot, and this is a common way to display results from your GWAS scan. So if you look along the x-axis, it depicts um, the chromosomal region, so the red dots are chromosome 1, the blue dots are chromosome 2, and so on. And then the y-axis is the minus log p-values from the chi-square test of association. And then the, the blue line that's across the top of the screen, um, across the top of the figure, depicts the bar that they set for genome-wide statistical significance. So any dot that lies above the blue line um, would be considered a statistically significant association between a particular SNP and, in this case, lung cancer. So I circled the 10 SNPs that they followed up in their stage two replication. So these SNPs all were found to be statistically um, associated with lung cancer. So then the next slide is a table that summarizes the results from their replication analysis. They, um, in the table, I know it's hard to read, but you can look up um, the paper. I have the reference at the bottom of the slide. In the table, they, they 
list the reference allele, the genomic region, the nearest genes, and the odds ratios that resulted from the analysis, along with the p-values from the test of association. And let's see, the red box that I have calls your attention to the two SNPs that, of the 10, that actually replicated in the two additional study populations. So if you look, these two SNPs are in chromosome 15. And the odds ratios from the test of association are around 1.3, with a very low p-value of around, in one case, 3.15 times 10 to the minus 18, and the other 7 times 10 to the minus 18. So this next slide, which is figure 2 from their manuscript, depicts this um, locus on chromosome, or this region on chromosome 15. And so the, the top panel shows, it's just sort of um, a blown up image of that Manhattan plot. And um, it shows the individual SNP lung cancer association p-values within about a half megabase region. And then the bottom panel shows the genes that are found within this particular region. So they were able to identify at least three known genes and then one hypothetical gene. So again, I think just to bring us all onto the same page as sort of what kind of information we're gleaning from these genome-wide association studies. And the next slide is, for those of you who are interested, the NHGRI uh, GWAS catalog, which is curated by my colleagues in the Office of Population Genomics, Dr. Lucy Hindorf and Heather Junkins and Terry Minolio. Um, the catalog is a database of all published genome-wide association studies. So as of today, I believe there are 471 publications and for each one of the publications, there's a very nice display of the um, SNPs that were identified, the particular gene region, um, the effect size and p-values, the genotyping platform that was used. You can download all the data into an Excel file. And you can learn more at genome.gov, GWA uh, studies. So what are some unique aspects of genome-wide association studies? They essentially permit examination of genetic variation at an unprecedented level of resolution. So again, we're looking at 300,000 to a million SNPs we're interrogating at one time across the genome. They allow for agnostic genome-wide evaluation. So instead of doing our um, typical candidate gene studies where we previously would have selected you know, a, a few up to a dozen or so candidate genes with known biological relevance to a particular disease or trait, here, we're sort of scanning the entire genome to see which interesting regions light up, and then we can follow up with them. Uh, once a genome is measured, it can be related to any trait. So we're investing a lot of money in paying for these genome-wide association studies and other large-scale genomics projects, which are still very expensive. So if we're actually um, collecting genotypic information on someone, it would be nice to ensure that when the studies are initiated, that investigators are collecting a useful amount of phenotypic and exposure information so that we can use these studies for more in-depth analyses and to share, perhaps, data across studies. We've also learned that um, most robust associations in GWAS have been with genes not previously suspected of being related to the particular disease or trait, and then some significant associations are in regions that are not currently known to harbor genes. So there's a really nice uh, overview of GWAS studies by David Hunter and Peter Kraft. And in their paper, they say the chief strength of this new approach also contains its chief problem. With more than 500,000 comparisons per study, the potential for false positive results is unprecedented. Thus, the sine qua non for belief in any specific result from GWAS is not the strength of the p-value in the initial study, but the consistency and strength of the association across one or more large-scale replication studies. So this perspective on the importance of replication is also captured in an excellent report from the NCI and HGRI Working Group on Replication and Association Studies. It's a, great, uh, it's a great paper if you're interested in taking a look at it. And within the paper, they highlight the important aspects of a GWAS study design, what should be presented in your uh, publication resulting from your study. And they also focus on what are the important aspects of a replication study. And they focus on the fact that, obviously, a similar phenotype needs to be used. So you do your initial study, and then when you do your replication study, it's extremely important to make sure you're evaluating the same phenotype in a population. 
So this example, um, we're on slide 12 now, is gives us an idea of, of why it's important to use the same phenotype in your replication studies. So Karen Hex group set out to replicate an interesting finding from a GWAS on major depression. Uh, Patrick Sullivan and his colleagues had previously reported a significant association between the RS252283 SNP, which is in the PCLO gene, and major depressive disorder. So Karen's group set out to evaluate the SNP in a population-based cohort. And they initially identified 579 cases with depression or depressive syndromes from their Rotterdam study, which is a prospective population-based cohort of persons over 55 years. And then they, they identified 912 controls from that same population. So these 579 cases were heterogeneous and either had a diagnosis of depression using uh, DSM-4 or a broader label of depression, depressive syndrome, which can include uh, minor depression or self-reported depression, et cetera. So when they ran their first pass analysis, you can see the odds ratio of 1.10 and a p-value of 0.2, which isn't significant. But they do a really nice job in this paper of describing um, their follow-up where they narrowed down their phenotype and focused in on a more homogeneous set of cases. So the next analysis, they um, focused on DSM-4 depression only. And you can see when they did this analysis, the odds ratio was 1.42, and the p-value was significant at 0 0.0025. And to further, further illustrate the point, they actually then focused in on major depression only. So they kicked out a few cases from um, the second row of this table. And again, you see the odds ratio increases just a bit, and the p-value is 0 0.0014. So again, I just put this example up to um, illustrate the importance of using the same phenotype in your replication study. So in addition to needing standard measures to facilitate replication, um, standard measures are also useful because we can more easily combine data from multiple studies. If you use standard measures, instead of having to sort of go through the painful process of harmonizing data, data from studies that use different methods for collecting their phenotypic or exposure data. Also, when we study the genetics of common complex diseases, we're expecting that effect sizes of the, the SNP trait associations to be relatively small, you know, an odds ratio of 1.3 to, to 2.0. Um, and in order to be able to detect these small odds ratios and also gene-gene and gene-environment interactions, we need very large sample sizes. So combining studies with similar phenotypes is probably the most efficient way of generating these large sample sizes. Unfortunately, the ability for research groups to actually do this and combine their data has been limited because there really has been a lack of standard measures that have been incorporated into existing studies. So taking that into consideration, we developed an RFA for a cooperative agreement that ultimately led to the Phoenix Project. Um, again, Phoenix stands for Consensus Measures of Phenotypes and Exposures. And Dr. Carol Hamilton from RTI International is the PI of the project and has been leading this effort for the past two point two and a half years now. Um, the goal of the Phoenix program is to develop a useful resource of standardized phenotypic and exposure measures for the genomics research community. We're focusing our efforts primarily on selecting 15 high priority standard measures for each of 21 research domains. And I'll review these 21 domains in a minute, but we focused on just 15 measures for each domain to keep this task, this project, a reasonable one. And also because when you're collecting data from your study participants, you need to obviously respect their time. Um, so by picking 15 of the most useful low burden measures to capture a particular domain, we're hoping to provide researchers with a nice, um, nicely sized set of measures that they consider um, consider incorporating into their studies. And then the measures that the, um, are selected through Phoenix are made available to the research community free of charge via the toolkit, and we'll walk through the toolkit in a little bit. Um, we're hoping that researchers will visit the toolkit. Uh, you can see the URL here, which is phoenixtoolkit.org, to consider Phoenix measures um, when they're planning new studies, also to add Phoenix measures to an ongoing study. 
and also to obtain high-quality measures outside of their area of expertise. So if I'm studying um, the genetic epidemiology, epidemiology of dementia, I might be interested in including a few measures, say, from the cardiovascular domain and a few measures from the diabetes domain. But that's not my area of expertise, so I know that I can come to the Phoenix Toolkit and an expert panel of um, scientists have selected a small set of measures that might be useful for me to incorporate into my study. So I sort of don't have to do much work in advance. I can come to the Phoenix Toolkit, sort of take a look around, pick out some interesting diabetes and cardiovascular measures, and then take them back and incorporate them into my study. And then again, just to, to bring home the point, we're hoping that people you know, across institutions start using some of these measures that um, their studies will then be compatible with each other and will be more um, efficiently able to combine studies to increase power and our ability to identify uh, genes associated with complex diseases. So these are the Phoenix domains. Um, there's 21 listed on the slide. I won't go through all of them. Um, once the project was funded, we organized a steering committee with um, expertise in genomics of complex diseases, genetics, epidemiology, and statistics. The, the committee is chaired by Jonathan Haynes from Vanderbilt University. The steering committee provides overall guidance to the Phoenix Project, and they are the ones that selected these domains that we would focus our efforts on. Um, also, the NIH Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research committed funds for the 21st domain, um, which is the social environment domain. And we hope that this will be a nice complement to the psychosocial and the environmental exposures domains. So once these 21 domains were identified, we began assembling expert working groups to do the, to the hard work of, of reviewing the measures that are already out there in the community and selecting the most useful standard measures for each of these research domains. So we're on slide 17. So we'll just quick walk through the process for selecting the Phoenix measure. So once we picked the 21 domains, the, the steering committee took a first stab at defining the scope of the domains. What are some of the important aspects of cardiovascular disease or demographics or environmental exposures are important for genomic studies? Then the expert working group did a survey of the literature. They contacted you know, many of their colleagues in the field and identified a broad list of measures. And after um, a, you know, a few um, meetings and conference calls, they were able to narrow down their list to 25 measures or so. And then these measures are sent out to the community for input. And ultimately, after a process of about eight to 10 months, 15 measures are um, selected and incorporated into the Phoenix Toolkit. And the criteria for selecting the measures include that the measures have been well established so that they're used often, and we know that they've been broadly validated so that they're reliable and they're valid measures. Um, these measures are low burden to the participant and investigator. So in some cases, the Phoenix, Phoenix Toolkit doesn't include the, the gold standard measure if they're a very burdensome or very expensive measure to administer. Um, the measures are applicable across population groups and that the um, measures, the instruments, and protocols are freely available without charge. So the Phoenix Toolkit um, for each of the measures includes um, a deca detailed protocol for each of the measures, so in very detailed instructions for the appropriate way for collecting the information. It includes a nice description about why the working group chose this measure, why they feel it's important in genomic studies, and then all the um, relevant references. There's also a lot of user support. There's a user's manual, um, frequently asked questions. There's um, links to supplemental inf information, and then also various other resources like the Cancer Bioinformatics Grid or CAB. And a toolkit feature. So um, my favorite part of the toolkit is there's a quick start guide. So if you go to the front page, I'll show you in a minute, there's a red button that you can click and it sort of helps walk you through uh, the quick and dirty way to get at some of your measures. Um, you can choose your measures and add them to a shopping cart, kind of like, kind of like Amazon.com. Um, if you register on the website, which you don't have to do, but it allows you to save your, your carts and, and you could share them. So if I'm collaborating with someone um, you know, in California, I can prepare a cart with the measures I'd like to use in my study and share it with them so they, they can download the information and the documents and we don't have to 
sort of send all that paperwork back and forth via email. Um, if you're, you can once you select your measures, you can generate a nice report. You can notate, uh, add notation to the, the measures and the protocols. And something that RTI is working on is, is promoting a collaboration tool to facilitate investigators um, finding each other who are interested in sort of the same aspects of a particular um, study. So here's the home page that I was talking about. The red button is the quick start guide. Um, there are a few ways to enter the toolkit. You can go right to the browse button, which we'll go to in a minute. You could also search. So if I'm interested in um, hypertension, for example, I could type hypertension in and the measures, standard measures for uh, blood pressure would pop up. Again, here's my shopping cart, like Amazon.com, and then um, aspects of my account that I can customize. So here, let's just go back for a second. If I click on Browse, it would take me to the list of Phoenix measures that are currently available. So of the 21 domains that we've been working on, we have already deposited uh, standard measures for eight of these 21 domains, and the remaining 13 will be available by the end of 2010. That's the plan. So you can see we've got our measures for demographics, anthropometrics, like um, height and weight, for example, or uh, waist circumference, substance use, cardiovascular, nutrition and dietary supplements, environmental exposures, cancer, and oral health. So if I would click on the demographics link, it would take me to the list of the standard measures for demographics, and you can see the kinds of measures that the working group felt were important to include in genomics research projects. And here, then, I went to the alcohol, tobacco, and other substances domain. And I'm deciding to drill down on this measure called tobacco and nicotine dependence. And this is actually the working group selected the Phagostrom um, instrument to assess nicotine dependence. And you can see the toolkit provides you with sort of the definition, the purpose, some keywords. And then you can click on the protocol associated with the measure. And you can see exactly um, the instructions for administering the, the questionnaire and what the questions are. There's also more information about the source, so where this came from, um, the language. It's, this is in English, but it's available in others. The participants, so this should be administered to folks that are um, 17 years or older. And it gives you an idea of the kind of personnel and training requirements. So you can take a look at it and decide if this meets your needs and whether or not you want to go ahead and, and add it to your cart. So here, I just went through and I decided for my study I'm interested in incorporating some of the measures of age and ethnicity, uh, race, gender, health insurance coverage, family history of heart attack, and lipid profile. So once I have my cart, I don't have it shown here, but you can click a button to generate a report and also to um, share the cart as I described earlier. There's also some, some nice uh, bioinformatics features of Phoenix, which uh, RTI is continuing to develop. Um, they include links to other important resources like Cancer Bioinformatics Grid. So they are trying to uh, map the Phoenix measures to other resources so that we'll eventually be able to combine our data with many other studies. Um, they are working on extending their capability, capabilities. So for example, continuing to improve the, the smart query tools and, and your advanced search capabilities. They're also developing a, um, a data entry form for collecting measures. So this way, if you're interested, say I picked a set of, of measures, um, you can actually convert the, the protocol to whichever format is useful for you for your study um, manual. And you can also generate a data dictionary for the variables, which will help your programmers set up the database that you can use when you're collecting these particular measures. We're collaborating with um, many folks, both within the NIH and outside the NIH. We have a really nice collaboration with NCBI and the database of genotypes and phenotypes. So we're trying, again, to map our Phoenix measures to some of the data that's already deposited in dbGaP. We're working with um, the National Library of Medicine, again, and the LOINC team, which stands for Logical Observation Identifier Names and Codes. Um, and this LOINC is a nice reference of more um, uh, clinical terminology, and we hope that this will be able to um, expand our, our entryway into sort of electronic medical records. And we're also working with an international group called the Public Population Project in Genomics. 
So I just wanted to um, acknowledge the steering committee members and also our NIH IC liaison. So we have, um, from the beginning of the project, we've worked really hard to establish relationships with our colleagues at other institutes. And these experts have been helping us with every aspect of the Phoenix project. And it's been really great to work with them as well. And then lastly, just acknowledging my colleagues here at uh, the Office of Population Genomics, um, our friends at NCBI, and then our colleagues at RTI, in particular Carol Hamilton and uh, Lisa Strader, Debbie Maiz, Tabitha Hendershot, and you can see the list of others. So I think with that, I will stop and take any questions. Thank you. At this time, if you would like to ask a question or make a comment over the phone, please press star 1. Please unmute your phone and record your name clearly when prompted. To withdraw your request, you may press star 2. Once again, to ask a question or make a comment, please press star 1. One moment, please. Well, thank you very much, Erin. That was excellent. And yes, we will just wait a few minutes. I'm sure there are some questions coming in. Um, and also, if anybody, if you're having trouble with the phone, uh, you can certainly chat the questions um, into the, the webinar portion, uh, or you can email me uh, at sharding at mail.nih.gov if you're sitting by a computer. Um, Aaron, I did get one question in while you were talking um, that I'll just ask kind of over the phone, and um, that was whether there's information on how this is already being used, or if it if it is being take, used by um, by researchers, and, and if that's improving the quality of GWAS data, uh, kind of across the board in in reaching the goals that you were you hoped to, to that you set out to do. That's a really good question. So I sort of tried to describe some of our collaborations, for example, with dbGaP. So when we're mapping our Phoenix measure, say the Phoenix measure for blood pressure. Um, we're trying to work with dbGaP um, to identify the studies in dbGaP. There's now up to oh, maybe 40 genome-wide association studies that have used um, this particular measure for blood pressure. So that's one way to show the researchers, you know, if I select this Phoenix measure, numerous other um, studies have already used it. So if perhaps if I incorporate this into my study, I'll be able to collaborate with them or use some of their data um, if I can get access through dbGaP to expand my work. So, and I think that's a really important aspect so we can have a sense of how these measures um, are being used and then encourage people that have already used the measures to perhaps collaborate with folks that are adding the Phoenix measures to their projects. Is there, I can't see, uh, what, you said there was a chat portion? Uh, you, it would. It would pop up, yes, and okay. So you might just ask me those questions if any come up on that. Yes, yes, I will. I will. I will send them in to you. And I forgot to. Um, I meant to include my contact information. If anyone has questions about Phoenix, please feel free to contact me. You can find me at the genome.gov website if you search the staff directory. So there is a question. Uh, oh, it just disappeared. Uh, the, there was a question, but it it went away before I could ask it. Um, so if that was somebody in our audience, please repost it. Um, huh. Well, are there any questions waiting for us in the queue? Show no questions at this time. Okay. All right. Well, then I'll I'll ask one quick question. Yes, there's one question in our queue about whether whether this can address rare diseases. Um, unfortunately, because we were trying to limit our, we had to limit our scope to have sort of a um, something that we could accomplish in, a, in a, a few short years. Most of the working groups have elected to focus on conditions that are more prevalent. Although that being said, I think an important aspect of when you're trying to study rare diseases is that oftentimes, you know, you have um, investigators across, spread out across the country that each might have a few cases of a particular rare disease. And if they're not collecting sort of the standard demographic and other phenotypic information in a standard way, it's 
really difficult then, as I was describing in my talk, to, de to combine those data and have enough power to do some interesting analyses. So if you're doing a rare disease research, it, it would be useful to adopt something like the Phoenix standards, um, which would then be able to facilitate you know, the, the researchers around the country who have a smaller set of cases to combine their data more efficiently. Great. And I, I guess related to that question, I was just emailed another question about, um, so perhaps not rare diseases, but can Phoenix be used for non-GWAS studies? Absolutely. Um, the, we come from the Genome Institute, um, and so sort of the focus has been on GWAS and genomic studies, but I'm an epidemiologist at heart, and so any epidemiological study could use these measures. It's just you can, you know, once you collect the information, you can certainly add the genomics component to it, but um, the way it's set up is that these measures are amenable to most any kind of study of, of human um, disease. So another question I had is, is whether you have been a part of any conversations or thoughts about whether Phoenix would become a part of, of training kind of for up-and-coming epidemiologists or up-and-coming researchers. Is that something that you would hope this might get integrated with? Um, well, I think it would, Phoenix would be a particularly useful resource for younger investigators who might not have the experience experience or have been around enough to know which are the most, you know, useful measures for their particular field of study. And so I think by coming here it might save them some time and it could help focus them in on the, the um, relevant measures for a particular trait. And then I do know that um, we have some colleagues that have been thinking about using this as a tool so for their, their new um, grantees, for example, that they would this would be a good starting place for them to get started. So they know these measures are already out there. It would be sort of a quick um, one-stop shopping for them. Great. Okay, let's ask the, the operator, are there any other questions in the queue? I don't know for the questions at this time. Okay. All right, there's a new question in the log. Um, could you describe the relationship to Phoenix items uh, to the CA Big question repository. So, or rather, could you describe the relationship to Phoenix items to the CADSR question repository? Are all Phoenix measures in the CADSR? From now, I'm I RTI. I wish they were on the call to answer this question. But from my understanding, um, every Phoenix measure has been registered, so you'll be able to find every every Phoenix measure in the CA Big repository. There's a Phoenix identifier for it. All right, my, my email is, is uh, very active, so here's another question. Will the measures developed to address these domains be updated? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So we are um, thinking about this now. This is originally a three-year project. But we obviously hope that these measures are being used, and if they are being used, we realize that the, um, you know, the methods for interrogating phenotypes and exposures are changing and improving with time. So our hope is if we can show that these measures are starting to be used, it will convince our, our friends at the NIH to help um, expand the program for an additional few years, and if that's the case, we'll um, reconstitute our working groups occasionally to come back and review the measures to make sure that there's been no significant changes or if there's something late breaking um, that is really important and critical to include that we can include it. So that's something that we're just um, working on right now. Great. 